So I'm delighted to have you all here today. We're so happy to host this at Aberdeen Art Gallery. We're absolutely thrilled. And I'm now going to hand you over to Lynn Kilbride. Yay! I got the name right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Lynn. <laughs> I was feeling the same about it. I'm going to stand beside you. Yeah, so I don't absolutely. Stand in front of people. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be here on behalf of Robert Gordon University, which um, the Gray School of Art is part of and, and a very valued part of the university, to really welcome all of you to this um, graduate, graduate and residence conversation event. And um, I think, first of all, we need to just acknowledge the wonderful students that we've got in front of us because without them we wouldn't be here and um, without the students we wouldn't have the university so thank you very much. I'm going to need to run away after I've done this introduction but I'll come up to look again about half past six and see the wonderful work. I can't wait to see it. Um, this nurturing and development programme is one that's really valued, valued and appreciated by our students and I would suggest this year more than ever you really did um, graduate in such challenging times and I'm just hoping that this has given you the opportunity that COVID inhibited and I, I just um, hope that this is the first stage in a journey for you guys that you're really going to be able to take your creativity and make a massive difference to the world. You've made a massive difference being graduates of RGU but I really hope this has given you this next step. Um, all of our students used to do, all of the students today use their fantastic um, art and heritage collection to create the pieces that you will see on display down at the Look Again project space. They have illuminated and responded through uh, their own lens to what the past has inspired and, and to them to create pieces both in clothing, textiles, ceramics and film and others that I'll see later. I've only given you some examples because I've not seen it yet. To create um, and we will get them to see, then we will get the pleasure of seeing down at Look Again space both the past and the present together. And I can only assume that it'll be a wonderful experience. Today is also the first event of our degree show, um, one of the um, biggest events that we have up in Robert Gordon University. So I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you all up to Robert Gordon University from Saturday onwards to look at some of the other work that our students have created and put on display. It's been the first degree show for two years, so there's a lot of excitement and hub in the building and we would like to welcome everybody here to come and see that. Finally, I want to say thank you very much to the Art Gallery. You have been a wonderful collaborative partner for us and you really do so much and it's really valued, so thank you for that. I need to fa thank um, the Grey staff who not only have supported and nourished and created these wonderful individuals, but also to you, Judith, for hosting this event today. That will be great. The Look Again team and our Art and Heritage Collection. I think most of all, though, I'm just going to say thank you very much again for being wonderful students and wonderful graduates. And we can't wait to watch you going on the next part of your journey and, and making a massive difference to the world with, through your creativity. So thank you. You deserve the applause, not anybody else. But we really look forward to celebrating your <coughs> work. Well done. Okay, so let's begin. Um, I'm Judith Winter. I'm a curator, but I've also um, teach um, and lecture at Gray School of Art. Um, I also would like to thank very much um, Aberdeen Art Gallery for hosting this. And isn't it great to be back in a physical space? And I think that um, that's what I've most enjoyed um, this last week, watching um, also the degree show and watching it emerge. Um, I've written a little bit uh, uh, an introduction to this because um, I've been asked really to give you some background to the whole project. And then I'm going to do my best to um, uh, facilitate a conversation with eight people which I've never um, done before, so um, w let's see how that goes. Um, I have questions for each of you to, to start the ball rolling. And of course, I'd like to say to the audience, if there are things that you would like to ask, please, um, you know, uh, we'll open it up um, after everybody's had a, a conversation. So my introduction, I wanted to start. The exhibition Emergent in the Look Again project space is, um, as Lynn has mentioned, it's by graduates and residents. So there are emergent artists, makers, designers. Um, they're beyond students now. 
And um, the exhibition is drawn together through their, what I would say, their shared situation. Um, and really some of this came from our conversations uh, um, through the process, um, which is that, like most group exhibitions, particularly degree shows, um, this is very different from the dynamics of self-organisation, you know, a group of artists deciding to show together or work together because they have a very, very specific thread. Um, however, what is really interesting to me um, as a curator is often um, the process of being part of something where you don't really know the other participants when you begin. And the circumstances dictate alternative, um, alternative ideas. And those ideas grow. And artists and makers and designers start to find allegiances. And equally, they also recognize their points of difference. And that's very important to the creative ecology. Difference is really important. Often the initial years after art school are like this, chance encounters, happenstance, and they, I think, are the most formative um, experiences, even though they may feel unsettling, uncertain, unknown, unpredictable. So the title here is really important of this exhibition, Emergent. Um, it, donate, it denotes the process of becoming visible following a period of growth and experimentation and the physical sense of coming to light or exposure of new possibilities. So the simple word means obviously a great deal to people in the arts because it describes the way art and social and cultural transformation and our attitudes often grow in unexpected places. They can't be managed into being. They're responses to situations that are often beyond our control. And that's perhaps why um, arts are particularly potent at times of crisis and uncertainty. Um, and all the participants across all the different disciplinary fields graduated at different times, as I understand it. And um, you were affected by COVID. Um, most missed out on the experience of a physical degree show. Many of you were unexpectedly um, forced into different directions and also to present physical work. Um, instead of presenting physical work, presenting work in the digital realm and in the virtual space. And this relationship between the physical and the digital is what I understand was a really big starting point for a lot of your discussions and also discussions with George Shane, who I hope's here, from the RGU Arts and Heritage Collection. And it's why, in a way, the trigger of objects that you've chosen is so fascinating to me, because um, it's about this conversation with things from the past. So um, what I'm going to be asking you is really um, something about your situation and how the pandemic alters your practice or altered it. Um, for Look Again and other arts organisations, it also changes the nature of curating and exhibition making. And for me, this was also palpable in an art school where students would usually be covered in white paint or plaster dust and they would be in this atmosphere of really charged emotion and there and as work was installed in real physical spaces um, new ideas would occur and so the studios were silent and students were of course inventive tenacious pragmatic they found ways to work together despite the situation and they really understood the challenges of staff and were really generous, and, re and um, that I really thank you for. All of the staff, I'm sure, would thank you for that. An art school environment is a space where one learns through doing, through hands-on endeavor, through conversations in the corridor, on stairwells. It's a time and a space um, where one's creative voice develops 
through negotiation and communication, real human experience. And the networks and the relationships and the experiences that I think you forged, um, you know, they can last a lifetime. And that's really important for future career, future projects. It occurs to me that none of the art students um, or the graduates and residents here were interested in making, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, none of you were interested in making some collective statement. Um, I think you were really celebrating variation, the differences in the ways of seeing and looking and knowing. And if we think of this, we're connecting to the real grassroots of the art school, the art school DNA. And many of you who I've taught will know that um, I'm really interested in that art school ecology from Bauhaus, Black Mountain and beyond, but also here in Aberdeen um, Art Gallery, which is the basis of, um, of, of our Gray's art school, John Gray's patronage. So this idea of the uh, practical idea of arts and crafts that <coughs> emerged from doing um, and practical ideas about, you know, how to develop um, uh, the next generation of art students. And at Gray's School of Art, which is a wonderful, wonderful campus, um, it's actually was designed by an emergent architect. Um, Canadian architect Michael Schuen, not really, you know, n not far out of architecture school, and um, and he, there he had this amazing possibility to create an art school, and he describes um, this inspired by post-war optimism after war and after crisis um, as an environment of secluded community in which to equip the student with knowledge and skill for navigating life. And that seems very similar to today. Um, so, um, I'm going to start um, the process of the conversation and I'm just going to give a little bit of information about what I saw over in the project space. Um, obviously, I'm hope all of you are invited to that project space. So, um, uh, but this is what this, this is my observations of that. And then what I'm going to do is ask you all a series of questions and then we can open up the conversation. So I hope that's okay. So from my observation, um, the work is really interested <coughs> also, um, although I've said it's about difference, it's also interested in continuity um, and this relationship to the past that, um, uh, that Lynn mentioned is very important here. Um, Beginning with a map of, you know, uh, this kind of notion of mapping and networks. And I know Maria Roman, who's here, your work is um, uh, uh, really interested in that kind of mapping of conversations. And um, so uh, you've created a kind of map of those networks and through conversation with the other students. Um, other graduates and residents. I'm not going to call you students because you're no longer students. The site responsive work of Iris, Iris and Marcus, Marcus, hello Marcus, um, that both um, mine the overlooked <coughs> objects and places and they make visible something of these kind of lost possibilities buried amongst the rubble. Um, Joe, uh, the, I've been really fascinated by your ceramic process um, since being a graduate, but also after. And what I really like about the work there was it listens to materials in response to uh, in a responsive and improvised way. Um, it speaks openly, I think, um, about how the limits of working within your environment altered maybe the way of, that you work. And whilst, um, and equally, Cameron, I think that you're really interested as well in these locations that you often describe as a no place. Um, so I'm really interested in this mapping, this place, this sense of place that you all have. And it's also, dis um, I think Cameron's work, I think it's also inspired, this notion of no place is related to what Lynn was talking about, about time, the way things connect between the 
heritage collection, the past, the present and the future. And it's just inspired by a deep interest also in future thinking or speculation or the relationship between science and creative experiment. And that's very exciting. Um, ben, so we're colleagues now, which is really great. And, um, and I think that Ben, you use the tradition of mapping a lot in your work or the thinking about how things connect in the landscape, what they tell you about deep time, <coughs> the threads of things, um, the photography is about perception of the environment and a sense of time and place and um, really enjoyed um, looking at those works and uh, really you know, trying to encourage everyone to, to take a real deep look at them. And um, the other, uh, the textile designs of Kirsty, hello Kirsty. So, um, they're also interested in this time, this notion of time, the um, weaves and knit together past, present and future. So you've got these sorts of traditions, but how do you move them on or take them somewhere else? So you see there are a lot of overlaps. And then, of course, we have got the collaborative duo, Joe. And I'm going to get the name, I'm going to do the name, Joe and Claudia. You see, because I've got the other name in my head, it's really hard. Because um, these, this collaborative duo also use alter ego, and so they use different persona, right? So, um, so today, but today you're Joe and Claudia. Okay, so I'm really interested in this ongoing relationship that you have also between history but history as seen in the maybe 1980s on videos and um and you know this kind of the the, the object that you chose uh, was really is really fascinating and i think that this notion of popular culture and technology is what you weave together as well as the notion of crossing boundaries and this is really where i want to start to open up the conversation now um, your work investigates fluidity, cro boundary crossing, gender fluidity, the way we fashion and construct identity through performative practices that montage um, memory, but also class and nostalgia and all sorts of ideas. So really fascinating works. So that's enough from me. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed that introduction. Um, but what I want to do now is invite you all to maybe just say who you are and something about the object that you selected from the, the collection, um, just very briefly. So should we start with you? Okay. Hello. I'm Claudia. <laughs> do that. Okay. Hi, I'm Claudia. I'm Joe. <laughs> um, and we chose... Well, we chose two, kind of, like the first one we chose. Our image from the collection was an uh, image of two women, like, doing an experiment. and But they're wearing, like, a mask and they're, mm. like, ironing. It was two students from the domestic science department that used to be part of the school. Yeah. Um, and they seem to be, like, measuring maybe, like, how much, I don't know, like... Oxygen it takes to iron, or yeah. uh, carbon dioxide it takes to yeah, iron, yeah. and there's like a metronome in the back, and it just like it looks like if you grabbed a bunch of random objects and like posed for a photo, that's mm -hmm. kind of mm. which how then kind of relates to the other object that we chose, which was this like big like Frankenstein machine thing that's like made up of different machines together <clears throat> to take to make a something. Photo, yeah, to do something, you know. So like uh, this this kind of. A lot of imagination. Yeah, for yeah. Both the room to just kind of like speculate what like those women were doing, what this machine could have been used for, and that kind of thing is like where our starting point was. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> 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 so, my name is Carmen Lyle. Um, I am the creative director, Heed Flunky of CN Lyle. Um, I graduated in fashion design last year. For this exhibition, Emergent, as I'm sure George will attest, I chose about 40 objects. <laughs> um, not because I loved them all, but because, again, with kind of like what you were saying, the path between them all. I've seen this, um, it's almost like uh, building on like my whole no place concept. 
um, I've seen this path between all these objects that were maybe not so obvious to someone picking them up. So without giving too much away, um, the object I chose was a box. And inside the box is loads of different components of a camera. Um, the concept behind that was the containment of time, capturing time. These components were once used to capture a place, and that place is now <coughs> separate. It's in no place. It's yeah. there we go. So it kind of exists um, with, and with my like fascination in science, I came across the uh, concept of an event horizon, and this one thing led to another, and I created my install based off that. Because everything I do is always built on, you know, like a little bit of lore, a little bit of like mystery. So, although I'm a fashion designer, I do like to make sure that I'm not just making clothes from the mono mannequin. It always has to be something <laughs> building onto that, building from that, which again feeds back to the emergence path. Yeah. Very good. That's good. Joan. Hi, um, I'm Joan Northedge. I am the graduate in residence for 3D design, but I focus mainly on ceramics. And I chose a piece by Rab Marjorie Banks, and it's a plaster cast of uh, broken paving slabs. But I, I was really interested in the work because he actually placed those slabs around the city in situ. And um, I think thinking about the idea of emerging, I really liked the idea that I was working with this artwork that spanned time and what could be achieved within those spaces. So that's sort of what grabbed me um, when I was looking at the collection and yeah, I think the the piece and then the piece as a whole and how it's interacted with the city. Hello. Um, so I'm Marcus Mearson. I'm the graduate resident for painting. Um, I'm a little bit different, I think, from the other guys. I graduated four years ago. So, yeah, the, the piece that I um, selected from the collection was a painting by George Litho. He was a student, well, he graduated in 2000, and it was actually quite tricky to find um, information on him. But I believe the, the piece that, that I've selected, we were actually interested in very similar things. So I uh, kind of found out through George, who eventually got in contact with him, that he was looking at um, the building site of the uh, RGU library building. So, and from in my practice, I'm kind of looking at um, like building sites as well. So there's this kind of uh, <coughs> yeah, interest of seeing like spaces um, kind of changing and progressing over time. So that was, uh, yeah, there was the kind of the interest there, uh, the commonality, so, yeah. Hi, I'm Kirsty. Um, I graduated last year in fashion textile design with a specialism in knitwear and the object I chose I didn't stray too far. I chose the Scottish knitwear series. Um, I didn't really stray from um, my interest too much but I was more interested in the thought behind um, the it's a series of photographs of um, fair isle knit from Shetland. Um, so I was interested in thinking about what goes into making the pattern rather than just making of textile. So drawing into heritage and thinking about what makes you as a person and that sort of theme of emergence of what am I now that I've finished art school? What am I going to make now? What of me feeds into my work? Um, now that I'm not just doing it for academic purposes, it's for alter purposes. So um, yeah, that's what I've drawn from. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Maria Roman, and I graduated uh, contemporary practice in 2020. Then I did the master's in curating. So thank you, Judith, for all the help. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, I chose uh, David Gotziko, who's his name, slabware piece. That was uh, a piece that uh, a sculptural piece that he's done in 79 in his third year of. Uh, 3D design and sculpture, it was back when the 3D uh, design and ceramics were conjoined together. So it was mainly because uh, my practice is actually artist-led curatorship, so I'm interested in sculptural elements <coughs> and installation. So that was my main um, drive there to, Thank you. yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Iris. Um, I'm the contemporary art graduate residence. 
Um, I graduated Contemporary Art in 2020, and I graduated my Master's in 2021 in Fine Art. So um, the work that I picked was David Pettigrew's work. Um, it was a painted door, and I don't normally do painting, so you'll see in my work that I'm not really a painter. So um, uh, I normally make more sculptural work. Um, I'm normally known under the name of a sofa girl or a, a skip girl. So uh, um, yeah, no, um, the guy, he graduated 71. So 50 years after I graduated my master's degree. So it was a huge, a huge gap. Yeah. And I like what you said about the when we were doing when we were all involved in the the um, uh, part way through yeah. we were involved in listening to kind of the development and the things that you were thinking about. I liked what you said about the back of the door. And you see, in a way you picked a door, so I, it is a skip, right? It is a skip. Yeah, well it was a door that he obviously found. Yeah. And he uh he painted on it because he wanted to paint on much larger surfaces. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, I first saw the back of the door when I first walked into uh, the collections. I was like, I like that. I want that. <laughs> Let's see what it is. And then it was lucky enough the painting, painted side was what I liked as well too. But the first thing I did see was the back of the door and how yeah. um, the time and the like, the like lines of the cracks and. And this relationship to the portal. So you've all talked yeah. about time, and I think this is really interesting. So Ben. <laughs> you... um, hi, my name is Ben Cairns. I am uh, also graduated from the Masters last year, and I'm the, one of the graduates in residence for the Masters. Um, communication design, I suppose, would be my speciality, but it's photography that I do. Um, I selected, it's a bit of an odd one, it's a science object, which isn't something that would normally kind of appeal to me too much. It's from roughly 1900s, uh, Friedrich Krantz or Dr. Friedrich Krantz uh, company that produces these kind of crystal teaching models. Um, the interesting thing for me wasn't actually the model itself, it was the thread inside it. It's a collection of different coloured threads that kind of come together and I had linked that to um, some theory by uh, Professor Tim Ingold from Aberdeen Uni who's an anthropologist looking at knotting theory where people's lifeline lines are kind of created through thread and places are made by the kind of conjoining of these threads or coming together in knots. So I kind of, through my photographic practice, wanted to find locations that were no longer used but had previously kind of had life kind of connection to make these places that then <coughs> that kind of had fallen by the wayside or people had moved on to different ways of living. And I think that was kind of fitted into a lot of the themes that were coming through in others' work about time and, and place as well. Thank you. So um, I, I think what I'm going to do is I've got a series of questions that I've kind of geared to each one of you based on our experiences um, in conversation before. And so I, I want to just sort of start with, I think I might start with Marcus actually. Um, I remember um, bumping into you in the painting studio and, and, and a conversation that we had. And I remember then thinking, um, you were actually probably well, you weren't covered in paint because you're a neat painter, right? You are pretty neat. <laughs> you are quite neat. But um, I wondered how your attitude had altered, really, over the last year and being back in the studios. I've been sick. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Two. Uh, I wouldn't say it's changed, really. I just think it's really highlighted uh, the importance of... Um, Kind of shared studios because um, when I graduated uh, I was in the studio with uh, like two of my good friends but then they kind of left Aberdeen so then I was in the studio by myself for quite a few years until kind of coming back to Grey's mm -hmm. and it kind of yeah highlighted um, the importance of community um, and just kind of um, kind of shared kind of knowledge yeah. and just like through casual conversation I think I've really enjoyed that aspect of just speaking to people again, like having a, uh, yeah, that interaction, and it's this kind of like, um, yeah, kind of like sharing 
um, just through just casual conversation. Do you know what I noticed about painting studios is that um, the smell changed. You know, I know it sounds really bizarre, but it's it, you know it's that materiality, that like play with paint, that you know the physicality of the paint, the smell of it, mm. the, um, that you just don't get in a kind of in a in a kind of virtual sense, and the scale of things mm -hmm. how they shift and change. But I'm really pleased that you said that what really stuck with you is that notion of community. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important and it's really interesting. I'm um, so <coughs> Joe, I want to ask you something a little bit about that, but we were talking when we were developing the exhibition that about this notion of also the uncertainty of what happened, you know, the uncertainty of the pandemic and um, and also your relationship to it relates to what you were saying, um, Marcus, about space, your physical space, um, and how that had to really alter with ceramics. And so I kind of wondered if you wanted to say something about um, how you feel that relationship to uncertainty, that relationship to the material that you work with, and that notion of, of what, what happened to you during the COVID, you know, what, what you felt, how it, how it altered your practice? Um, I mean, it was massive for me, really. I, I, I ended up taking a year out. So I graduated in 2021. I was supposed to graduate in 2020, but I think at the time, with all the uncertainty of the pandemic and the impacts of that, it was too much for me. I, I ended up having to take a year out. Yeah. Um, and so coming back, I was in a position where we'd, bit, we'd had lockdown for a year by that point, um, but it was still so uncertain. I think we were all living sort of week to week. Yeah. And um, so for me, that really changed my practice because especially with ceramics, you're having to think about, you know, drying times, how, how you interact with the material. So um, it really forced me to take a step back. And, and one of the things that I did was strip out colour. Um, and I think that gave me an aesthetic that I've still I still want to explore and play with, and I think that's the sort of aesthetic that I've used in the piece. Um, so there's definitely what benefits. Was the that you had to strip out the is it practical? Yeah, it was practical. So there was a lot of the the practicality of that that uncertainty. You know, I think it narrowed down for me that with all that chaos and uncertainty, it was having to have that anchoring point. <laughs> and I think, I think moving forwards, and I've definitely seen it in this piece of work that because you're more anchored, you know, we're a bit more sort of able to think ahead. I think that's enabled me to push those other aspects a little bit more because, you know, it's not so overwhelming. I think when you've got so much uncertainty, it becomes chaos. And so it, it's got to be sort of tempered, mm -hmm. I think with so other aspects as well, and yeah and especially with my work I think you know uh, with this one I really pushed the materials yeah. and there is a lot of uncertainty of how it was actually going to look once it was fired but again I think it was tempering that uncertainty around that process with the knowledge about the clay so I think in everything there's a balance and I think that's probably what highlighted for me the most during the pandemic was Yes, uncertainty can be a really, really good thing for creatives, but I think it has to be, it has to be balanced out with something. Um, and the initial start of lockdown for me was the practicalities of living. You know, yeah. can I afford my rent? Where am I going to be working? <laughs> you know, all those practical things. So you didn't have the headspace to think creatively. Yeah. yeah. So I do think that um, when you were sort of talking, that actually that notion as well of, of having to sort of just adjust your rhythm, your daily rhythm, adjust um, your practices, but how also that opens up a kind of different way of working yeah. in some way. And, you know, and, and I think that's quite curious that actually sometimes these forces beyond our control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definite positives. There's, there's definitely been yeah. positives to it, um, but I think 
as well as you know Marcus was talking about community and I think you know the really nice thing about this process is I think we've all come together quite a lot as a collective and I think thinking about your wider community that you're situated in it's the impact of those things on everybody else you know what does that uncertainty look like for artists trying to start a career mm -hmm. during lockdown yeah. with with those practical uncertainties I suppose yeah. and yeah if we don't voice them we can't address them so I think it is voicing it but yes yeah, so there positives but I, I don't think we we can forget those other aspects yeah. because I think that's really important for us strengthening the arts in Scotland and in Aberdeen you know to address them. Now it's really interesting because there's two of being here that I thought um, had a very interesting um, response to the virtual degree show. So, uh, as everybody probably knows, um, that that um, uh, the Look Again team and Grace School of Art did an incredible job at making sure that there was a degree show um, at, at, that, uh, at that time and uh, or some form of, of um, opportunity for you all. But um, I was interesting because Cameron um, and I think Maria, um, I think you both had a slightly different response to uh, what that opened up for you. And so I'll start with Cameron. Um, I wanted to ask how did um, not having the physical free show impact your practice? And what do you think about this relationship between the physical and the digital brand? Um, not having a physical show for me worked out because kind of feeding on what Joe said, the practicality of being at home, it's very hard to make a massive collection in your living room. Um, so for me, the digital show was a benefit, but I think as far as like the relationship between the digital and the physical, um, it's always been present, but it was never fully valued until, you know, to, for the power that it brings until we had to use it, especially in the younger years of specialism such as my own fashion design. Um, before the pandemic, it was unheard of to see students of fashion specifically using virtual environments to not only design, but also like conceptualize and display their work. Now, as from what I've seen as a graduate residence in an art school that's virtually back to normal, students are spending just as much time at the sewing machine as they are at their computers and tablets. Um, the result of this is surely something we're going to see at the degree show. Um, and I feel we're now, even though that we're at a point of being normal, uh, the relationship of virtual and physical is so vital that one can't really exist without the other anymore. Yeah. Uh, you can argue that some work can't be fully appreciated when it's digital, but this relationship means that it can be appreciated in spaces that aren't necessarily contained. Um, you know, exhibitions last a couple of weeks, a fleet and fashion show can last 20 minutes, but by documenting that, your physical work can last forever online. And it can be seen, I mean, this is being recorded, so the people in the room here, they'll see this, but the hopes are people who couldn't make it can still appreciate this. And I think that it's just a symbolic of the relationship. So, so I'm wondering if that's really, so that kind of chimes with your no place idea yeah. in a way. Um, there'll probably be, um, certainly Kirsty, you might have a different view on that relationship to the digital and the physical. Um, I don't, did you want to respond to that? Yeah, I'm happy yeah. to. I mean, obviously textiles, I'd argue, is a very tactile. Yeah. Um, way to work and I really draw on that for my stuff. It's not 2D pattern, it's not print where it's on a printed surface. My work is entirely to do with texture, to be touched and to go up close and to really see. I do quite try to do quite detailed, very small fine gauge work so I find it quite hard to capture in photos and videos mm. the just everything about the work I was doing um, and I think this exhibition specifically I can now see the difference in what I wasn't too keen on in my virtual to begin with, but I now really am not keen on it at all because I've now seen how my work can be displayed physically and how all the elements are shown 
better. So I, I do. Th I think this this notion of variance of ideas is really good because it kind of you know we're not in a it, it shouldn't be an echo chamber. We should all have that's the beauty of of humanity, isn't it? That we've all got these different experiences. And I think Kirsty, I was going to say that there is also something to me about um, in your work particularly about the passing of ideas from generation to generation um, that maybe is quite a kind of uh, a common um, a common thread for that thread, you know but it is it is something that is, is very specific to people who work in weaving and textiles and you know because it's actually that whole notion of, of passing literally passing something to somebody else and the feeling of that you know, um, is very different to somebody like Cameron who's really interested in like speculating about the future, about sending something off, the, maybe even sending a message to the future, you know. I, I, I think it's, that's really fascinating, that difference. Maria, did you want to say something? Because your work, um, I know that during the uh, pandemic, your work was very much about collecting um, uh, so you've mapped in this exhibition different people's connections to things but in um, your previous work as well you were very interested in this relationship between the digital and everyday life and I just wondered if you wanted to say something about that. Yeah, that happened during the master's uh, program so uh, yeah the thing is I really wanted to sort out and seek out sort of like <clears throat> research methodologies or just gather as many resources I, I, I could I could have in order to you know try to produce work yeah. even physical work so be, because it was during uh, COVID obviously and I just I was just thinking about a set of you know set of methods set of materials that could be used during the pandemic I used interviews a lot mm -hmm. I used to make interviews with my peers and just ask them you know we have this sort of, you have this sort of thing so every kind of like interview was individualized yeah you know so for example I have Nina Stanger who is a 3D designer right and I uh, or I have done this with Iris as well, so, um, you know, I just asked them, so this is your theme, you're going from point A to point Z, what do you think it's needed, do we, you know, because we, we sort of had to come together within this collective trauma that was COVID, you know, and just create our, or perhaps reinvent our own Practices. mobile wunderkammer of uh, possible archives of methodologies and so it changes what I suppose what you're trying to say is that it changes your experience um, being in that situation changes the way you gather things it yeah. changes the way you Absolutely, connect to yeah. things so conceptually that is really yeah. I can see that in your work um, this now brings me to a question that I had um, let me just remind myself. <coughs> yeah, Claudia and Joe, I wanted to ask you something about that because we had a really, we had some really interesting conversations about um, collaboration, and and I'm really interested in this kind of different identities that you create for different projects. But the core question that I really wanted to ask was. Um, you know, do you think that you would even be working in this way if there had not been a pandemic? One, and um, you know, and um, what do you feel that that experience? How did it change? You know, how did you come together? How did you start to collaborate? And I just would like to, you know, think about that. Whether you would have worked in a very very different way had it not happened. Uh, I think eventually we would have worked on something together. <clears throat> yeah, I think like we were both um, 
we both wanted to do something with performance, but it was like this scary thing, you know, like to do it on your own. So I think like having a hand to hold and that kind of thing was like what we both needed to like go down that route. But uh, there was that like, we started working together like during that kind of period that you're talking about where we were living week by week and we're kind of in and out of the art school. We don't really have studio space half the time. Sometimes we did. So also to do performance was like, okay, well we can do it anywhere. And especially with the kind of like playing with identity and stuff, it was like, okay, well, we're also just like making up these uh, worlds for these characters as well. So it could just be based on wherever we had ended up, you know? So it didn't need to be based on like, okay, we have to go to the studio and, and do stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I feel like doing performance, like, cause we started just at the start of our fourth year of uh, contemporary art. And I feel like doing that because in like with the restrictions and stuff that let us just like have even more freedom with it. Mm. I think because I didn't really have any expectations of what like life would have been like after graduating, even if there hadn't been a pandemic. Because like it's hard to say like oh this is what your career is going to be like as an artist, yeah. you know. So I didn't really have any expectations anyway. And then to do something that was just like kind of throwing everything that I was doing a little bit like to the wayside to do something that was more fun in a time when <laughs> we really like felt like we needed it. Looking for it. <laughs> See, um, I really like that. I really <clears throat> like what you're saying about that idea that you were, you were almost like, you know, just searching for some joy mm -hmm. in the, in the, you know, in the routines or in the habits. Or yeah, the, the stuff that I had been making on my own before was so like sad and like, <laughs> just like, I don't know, you know, like serious. And I was like, for a while, I was like, oh, like, no, <laughs> you know, like, okay, I'll do Me something. Me in the sunshine, like, come over here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's fun. like started for, with us just like messing around with a camera and like following each other around doing silly things. And then it grew arms and legs from there. So. You see, that's yeah. really interesting in relationship to what Marcus was saying about that community as well that kind of you created your own community because you because two people could work together right mm -hmm. or you could create your own family your own it's almost like you could create your own world within a room or within a public space that you're allowed to take a walk in yeah yeah it's definitely like really yeah. kind of got that kind of escapist quality to it yeah um yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's very good so Ben, I I would oh, now. Have I got your question? Probably not. So I'm just going to ask you a question. It's I would really like to know um, about you know you you said about kind of coming across that scientific object mm -hmm. and um, you talked a little bit about Tim Ingold and um, you know and I'd just be really interested in the process of working on the. Um, in this project is really, you know, how it's really shifted your practice. Um, how, how has it changed from that pre, you know, that time when you couldn't um, share ideas with other people and how has it changed since then? You know, what, what's been the main differences for you? Um, firstly, I think I was able to do stuff I suppose. So um, during the pandemic, I was working a lot. I worked for the NHS and my kind of other time. Yeah. And so there was kind of a feeling of putting stuff on hold. And as a landscape photographer, the kind of inability to go to specific locations to make the work that I wanted to make was quite shackling in a way. And I didn't have a particularly exciting garden, it has to be said. So there wasn't much kind of to, to keep me going there. So. Um, the ability, I suppose, in, in responding to an object um, that was maybe not dictated to me, but that was forcing me to move out with my usual kind of um, projects and, and way of working, it kind of, I think, made me really, one, have to stop and have a good look at the collection, because in the past it's always been something I've kind of walked past, I've poked my head through the door when it's been open and looked in a bit of wonder but not really had the time to actually yeah. interact with the objects and to find, um, find out more about what the collection is there to be, why some of the objects are in it and kind of what benefit it, it kind of has for students. 
And I think having been tasked with this um, requirement to, to go and respond to an object really kind of, firstly it was quite daunting because there was just so much to choose from. I was uh, looking at space capsules, I was looking at various other kind of um, yeah, objects that, that maybe didn't have any link to what I was looking at doing, whereas this maybe has a bit more of a tangible link in some ways. Um, so it was quite daunting at first, but I think then finding something that I was interested in, regardless of the connection in some ways, and then forging that connection through kind of research and, and reading was probably the approach I took. And I think in terms of then moving forward with it, it did give me an opportunity to have to go out onto location and find these areas that were um, fitted with the kind of themes I was pulling apart from the object and um, I settled on the end in three different locations that all had something quite different but mm. um, so, so what you're saying is that when, when you actually were looking at the object you actually, it, it triggered a place for you to actually go to or it's, that's interesting in relationship to no place mm. you know, this, the, it, but it, it was actually t calling you to go somewhere or Yes and no. In some yeah. ways, it it wasn't specific to one one place yeah. or or that, which I think was something that in the past had always been focused on. I want to explore here or there, and then create work around it. Whereas mm. this was giving me more the opportunity because it wasn't inherently connected to a specific location. It was more a sense of what I was looking to kind of explore. Then it gave me the opportunity to to then kind of find multiple places that might kind of fit with it and and kind of go to these locations and find what was there as opposed yeah. to with a preconceived notion of I'm going to go to this location and take images that look like this. Um, That's really interesting. So, so one thing that I'm hearing in that is that, you know, in a way, maybe it prevented you from being less predetermined, mm. if, if I'm reading you correctly. You know, so you, I really like that idea that you use something as a trigger, that it, it, it maybe suggests something to you, and mm. then you go off to discover it, like it's a kind of, uh, like a little journey of discovery that you allow yourself to do because maybe maybe because you can do that because things aren't so predetermined in a situation where things are a bit more uncertain. Mm. Um, I wonder whether you know that resonates with you. I think definitely. I think there's, it was very much an experience um, and I was looking to create through that experience of unpicking some of the locations and seeing what was there as opposed to um, yeah, having a pre-visualised um, expectation and I think that kind of goes back to I suppose going through the likes of the pandemic and that mm. that the being very shut off and, and un, put my teeth in, unable to, to go to these locations meant that by the time I could it wasn't really about going to specific places but more just getting out and, and kind of going through the motions of finding areas of interest and trying to unpick some of the yeah, history. Yeah, and, and maybe that re relates to that whole notion of ha happenstance and detour. Mm. And um, Iris, I, I'm just really interested as well in what you think about, because you spoke really well about the door and and this connection that you had to this, the back of this painting and the doorway, almost like a kind of metaphor for a kind of relationship between past and present like a portal almost but I'm really interested in what you think about also what mining <coughs> the RGU heritage collection told you about say continuity or the importance of that what you know did you feel that that was significant to you um yeah I, I think it was really um I always make works about like items and like yeah. places so like go into something like heritage and actually having to collaborate in a sense with an object that it's a painting obviously but to, to me it's more of an objectual thing if that's a word um, so it's yeah it's important for 
that kind of places too. Like, is this to it have create that, that relationship between that correspondence yeah. with some art student from the past yeah, who no. you somehow are connected to now? Even. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And you wrote to that? that no, I met him. You met so, him? Yeah, yeah. Okay. it's really nice, yeah. So, so that, I think that's really, <laughs> that, I mean, that's really fascinating that it's actually created some new relationships. And I, I guess in a way that's quite similar in the sense of making, you know, sending you to some of the place, Ben, you know, mm. uh, that's really interesting. So, okay, now, what else would I like to ask you? I'd like to ask um, all of you um, what you have felt has been uh, the most interesting part of being a graduate in residence, if that's possible. And not all of you have to respond, but if some of you would like to, I think that would be interesting. I mean, I would say just like um, going back after, you, you know, you like last time we were there, you know, it wasn't because it was the first year out of mm -hmm. uh, after graduating that we did it, right? So the last time we were there, it was all about like deadlines and coursework and stuff, as well as what we were doing, you know. Mm -hmm. So to be able to go back in there again and just not have any of that kind of nonsense, you know, <laughs> it's really nice, <laughs> you know, and as well to be able to like interact with students in, like, a, in a different way, yeah. uh, and also because it was like, you know, we'd obviously missed out on studio culture a lot during lockdown, so to get back in there and kind of have people there again was, was cool to see, so yeah. Yeah, I think that kind of breaking of, of you know, that sense of, of not having those systems bearing down on you, that mm. you have a bit more freedom to cross boundaries, really. Yeah. You know, maybe yeah. that's what you're interested in. Yeah, it's interesting because it's like, I think we both work quite well under pressure, so to have those deadlines and stuff was like, served a purpose. Mm. But yeah, it's like a totally different kind of feeling to not have to yeah, be approaching it in that way. It's nice. Yeah. Hmm. So I think that, you know, this idea that it's nice, you know, and it, is, it is kind of, it goes back to that introduction that maybe that I was trying to give, which is to say that often like really great things happen, really interesting art happens at times of crisis, not that we would want that to happen, we don't want crisis, we don't want to be in that situation, but it is really interesting how Artists and designers seem to, <laughs> I, I mean, it's a, it, it's a question, Joe. Um, I, I think that, you know, maybe we've had conversations about this um, um, at the last uh, table discussion, and I just wondered whether, because you wouldn't want to wish crisis on anyone, but do you think it's yeah. been positive in, uh, you know? Yeah, definitely. I think they. Yes, I think I think at the discussion I've been quite vocal of saying, you know, lockdown was rubbish. It was terrible, and it was, you know, and it was difficult. But I think that was not just us thinking about who we are as artists. That was just every aspect of everyone's life. It was yeah. terrible. But as far as my art practice goes, you know, it forced me to slow down. I was living by myself. I was having to work in a way that was really different, and was learning and. I think from that slowing down and having to use materials in the surroundings, you start to see that beauty in the everyday and the mundanity of it. And you know that was, that's what I think has traveled through my work is looking at these overlooked sort of throwaway things that we have and actually using them to show the beautiful aspects of life, you know, and that, you know, if we change the way that we perceive or are in those spaces, um, it can open up new emergent yeah, yeah. <laughs> spaces. But, yeah. I, mean, um, good, good place, I mean, it's a good place for us maybe to open up. Any questions? If anybody has any, just shall we, um, before we go over to um, project space, but. Um, I wondered if any of you have got any questions for this 
of emergence. Anybody? <laughs> yeah, that's one. Yeah, sure. Starts it off. Um, super. <laughs> so, yeah, thanks for that. That's been yeah great. So far. Um, I wanted to ask about. Yeah, every not everyone has to answer, but to all of you, um, there's a kind of reorganisation of life that happens with every graduating artist when you don't have the kind of pressure, but also like support system of those deadlines. Um, and I suppose I was interested in you don't have to say what your job is, but I'm kind of curious about secondary economies within emergent practices and actually pay the bills jobs can be really um, important aspects mm -hmm. of that. So I suppose I was interested in your experience of balancing your graduate and residence positions with kind of these secondary economies that you might um, do and how that's been for you. I was working for a domestic abuse project when uh, lockdown happened, so I think that was to have that headspace and to actually be working with families who were in crises in already in that meant that I think my practice just had to go on the back burner while you sort of figured that out. Um, but I think that has been such an influential part of my practice as well. I, I think my next project is looking at um, domestic abuse and um, women who were um, basically sent to lunatic asylums. Um, so I think there's definitely that overplay of different things that happen in your life and I think that's really important. And yeah, I'm a youth worker at the moment so I think again that always comes in because, you know, listening to what people are talking about, I think it's just yeah, always sparking points for further sort of investigation in your own practice. I feel like I could probably yeah. speak to this as well. Yeah. Um, I'm in hospitality 80% uh, of the time and I don't live here either. So I was, it was very difficult for me in the beginning to juggle everything as I also have my plans in my personal life as well as my professional development. I went, to, I went to go do my master's, but it's all coming straight out of uh, university and you're just, you're just hit with like, oh Christ, I'm an adult now. You know, like I've got, <laughs> I've got everything to do and I've got everything to worry about. And you know, like you kind of say with the deadlines, I've not got that strict um, schedule to work to. I've now just got all this time and I've got to divide it somehow for something that pays and something that doesn't. Um, I've struck that balance quite well, but it was not that easy to get to that point. There was a lot of juggling, a lot of some buts, lots of strains on friendships, relationships, all sorts. But coming out the other end, I've 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 got this whole belief that it's like you shouldn't be you shouldn't really be constricted by the time that you've got because I came out of uni in a competitive course um, where you're kind of fed this idea that if you don't act quick, you're gonna fall into obscurity. Mm -hmm. And although I've not really, I mean, this is probably my second body of work I've done since graduating. And although perhaps I might feel like I need to keep going, I need to, or I'm gonna fall into obscurity. I don't live here anymore, but I'm still able to come up and work up here and <coughs> not be not be like known, but have these creative networks to always feed into and like everyone that's graduated alongside me and you know the folk who have graduated the years before me, um, you, you build on these networks and you build on these like relationships so that when I am back in Dundee being a waiter, I'm not focusing on like, oh Christ, I've got to be a waiter in six months time. I'm more thinking about like, I wonder what I'm going to be doing in six months time. I'm quite happy to do this if it means I can still keep doing that. It's a big, big hill to get over, like mentally, you know, this whole falling into obscurity. But there's a lot of like peace when you get to that like realization because the master's degree for me is always going to be the goal. I can set myself, you know, time like two years, five years, 
but I'm never like I don't let the time in between my next thing dictate how I'm going to live or how I'm going to do things. I'm just quite focused on the next thing and just taking it as it comes. And now I'm pretty chill. I wasn't chill like six, tw six, twelve months ago, but now I'm pretty like, all right, cool. This is what it is. <laughs> Um, because actually one of the things that I always advise, always advise is that because, you know, through those experiences that you have these peaks and troughs as a creative that is very different to the rhythm of other people's lives and um, to not lose faith or hope or, um, you know, that actually in a way some of the things that you're describing is that new approaches to what you're um, what you're developing come out of the moments actually when you least expect them. So, you know, it is that kind of chance encounter, that conversation with someone that can absolutely change everything, you know. So I, I do hear that actually in all of, uh, because there's this, our educational systems tend to kind of just create like hurdles, but actually what we really need everyone to be able to do is to navigate those changes, yeah, or those peaks and troughs. And really, so that would be, in a way, something we could learn from you, which is, um, you know, actually, what do we need to prepare ourselves for? Maybe we need, do we need to prepare ourselves for an outcome? Or do we need, or a possible run up the ladder and, and a job at the end of it or do we actually need to prepare ourselves for being open to something some change of wind or um, uh, some chance encounter or, or how we kind of navigate and uh, listen to kind of what could be possible in the kind of rubble you know and I think that a lot, a lot of um, that's what I really feel from a lot of your work and really from this um, conversation today. How long have we got? Oh, I, um, I'm not very good at time. We've got, so we've still got a full 20 minutes to have a conversation. <laughs> so let's see, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody. It's really interesting like what you've got to say. It's just really, it's great that you can articulate your experience like that, it's really interesting to hear. Um, my question was for John and Claudia, and uh, relating to your practice, and it sounds like you um, had different forms of practice going through at school, and then you sort of landed on performance together, and I wondered how, if anything, how it changed you, like, personally. Hmm. I don't know. I think like it's that thing of like, okay, so run towards something that you're scared of in the hope of like <laughs> becoming a better person or something, you know, like <laughs> or a more whole being or some dumb shit like that. But like <laughs> there's always something else though, isn't there? I mean, so you're never gonna like make that. But I, I don't know, do you feel any different? <laughs> um I would say it kind of started from us having fun together, so like, that's kind of like the main, I feel like, output is to have, like, we're having fun, we're enjoying it, so definitely it doesn't feel like we're making work, we're... Yeah. And like... I mean, I know that what I was the like first, What was the first work you made then? What was the first bit of fun you had that you went, ding ding, this is like actually... Um, work or were you thinking that or were you just like this was an accident and then this accident's good or well, were you, or did you think let's do this and it'll be a piece of work yeah, it was I'm, it was quite like intentional but the well, intention I'm was about to a piece before that like before after <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a time that it was like after a night out that it was like the first time I went oh, yeah. back to your flat and he had a wig and then we like set up the camera and just like did like a 20 minute take of like just like a silly little made up thing. Yeah. But the, the, in fourth year, like the intentional we will make work together was like Joe had said, oh, I'm, I want to fall down a hill, will you film it? Mm -hmm. And I was like, obviously, I'll get to the top. <laughs> so 
But that was kind of the starting point. Was like, yeah, let's fall over. Yeah. And then it's just <laughs> going from there again, yeah. <laughs> and fall over. Yeah. I mean, I learned a lot from Claudia though, especially like at the beginning working together with like, because like obviously performance is like this kind of intangible thing, right? And I was kind of used to like putting value on making objects. And I think as well, kind of relating to like work and stuff as well. Like I've always been told to like, I don't know, just, you know, like go and get a job and all that kind of stuff. So to then do something where it's like, okay, well, <laughs> good luck making money doing that, you know? So like to, but to still feel like it was worth doing and to not necessarily put as much uh, pressure on that aspect of it was something that I got from you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, does that answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that kind of born out of hilarity as well at art school, where you go into a complete motor panic mode, mm -hmm. and then you just start exploding? Because mm -hmm. I know I remember myself, and, and uh, another guy, and the two of us used to do lots of that, like going up down the corridors with paint brushes clutched between our buttocks. That was the <laughs> <laughs> race of the day, and all these kind of things. But it was totally new, the, the washing line of pants for Christmas and stuff. And yeah. they were all kind of things which were born out of sort of craziness, and I suppose in crisis. And that's the one thing I suppose that I hear here is that you kind of have a crisis, and whether or not that's about a personal crisis or something much more, you know, much larger like COVID, yeah. that you then, um, as artists, challenge to make yourself happy in that environment or. Or, or do something positive in some kind of way. Uh, and as, it's lovely to hear that you guys have actually created a practice out of it. Um, and to be able to, to hopefully, because the stuff you do is brilliant, absolutely <laughs> sensational. I'd love to see so much more of it. And I suppose as well for Panda, I mean, I went through exactly the same thing when I graduated, that yeah. whole concept of having to grow up and kind of going down to London, being invited down there, and then you know, working with, with people, and it was very opportunist, and you talked right at the very beginning, Judith, yeah. about that idea of growing into unexpected places beyond our control, and yeah. just by being there, and kind of meeting somebody like Sandra Rose, and then the next thing, working with her, and then doing this and doing that, it all became something which I never expected, and then came back up here, wanted to change my life, and, and ended up being a diving instructor, <laughs> um, and so the next thing I might be trying so, you know, it's this lovely kind of um, want to just go with the flow of life and things seem yeah. to slot together and not be too panicked because I really panicked after work college that I had to be grown up and I was the same in hospitality and it was yeah. really safe mm. and it was good income and I made loads of tips and stuff but it wasn't quite doing everything although I met some lovely people but those people were really incredible along that journey to help me kind of get to some place now of, yeah. of learning. But the smell thing, you talked about that. Yeah, it's yeah. like yesterday I was with a load of very fortunate British Blue <laughs> Council and I was with a load of 100 and, 150 merino sheep and they were all getting sheared and I was like, <laughs> it was fantastic. But the smell, yeah, you know, the smell yeah, is, yeah. Is, um, is the most poignant thing and I missed so much at Grey's as well. That, those yeah. windows which come out of each room as you walk through <laughs> the building, some incredibly unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's lovely to kind of hear the experiences and they're not dissimilar. I think it's a crisis thing too, yeah, whether yeah. or not that's a personal thing or whichever it's lovely. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, I mean, these are really interesting things that are sort of coming out about, you know, these times. Like, you know, we often talk about, you know, we'll, obviously, in a way, you'll be the, you know, often I'd say to our students, actually, this is very strange, but you will actually call yourselves the COVID generation. I'm, I'm not sure that that label is a very good one. But it, but nevertheless, it actually, there's things that happen that change the way our, we work, change our attitudes, change what could be possible, change, you know, just throw us off course. I mean, you know, the most famous person to talk about that was Paul Clay, the artist, you know, who talked about um, this kind of play of forces that, um, you know that we're we're sort of we're like as human beings on tight ropes and you know we're having to kind of navigate and balance things so and um, that's very different to a kind of art school model that is about 
I don't know, um, you know, and I'm not criticising that in any way. It's just different, this kind of notion that um, we manage and create creativity. So, you know, do, do we, can we manage art into being? Can we manage or make stuff happen by our own agency? Or, you know, does stuff just happen? Um, so that might be a, a question. I, I want to ask some of you that. Do, does stuff just happen? Or do you feel like you can control and define what the future is? Interesting. Mm. I might slightly talk about getting the residency position of the same as Cameron and the same as Elaine is obviously saying coming out of uni and thinking oh my goodness I need to get the job now. Um, so applying for things over summer and you sort of start getting your rejection and then your rejection and then your rejection, your rejection, your rejection or not hearing back at all and if I had been successful on one of them I wouldn't have been sat here doing this. So it's that sort of interesting opportunity and from that you know, I started trying to think back on my residency, how much have I actually done with it, and I could count quite a lot of things that are so interesting that have come from it, the meeting Zandra Rhodes, working with the art gallery on certain other things, like getting to know um, all the lower years of art school that I've been in teaching that I wouldn't mm -hmm. have met otherwise. It's nice to touch base with and connect with, but mm -hmm. this opportunity, me sat here and me making this work, wouldn't have come about if I'd chosen a different path in within that, couple months in the summer which is a very short period of time when you think about it so mm -hmm. I think that's quite interesting. What about others of you? What do you think? Ben, what, how is it? I don't, I don't want to put anyone on the spot, I'm just like... Um, I think it comes through very much those opportunities and being open for the opportunities that come I suppose more than, I don't think it's necessarily managing in a way your kind of uh, how, you, how you're approaching things but just being open to the potential that things will appear and then being able to recognise them as opportunities and mm -hmm. the ones that you want to take and the ones that you maybe aren't going to, to benefit you long term and mm -hmm. having that kind of a bit of insight but also through kind of maybe not failure as such but through kind of trying the opportunities that come up your way and then deciding if they are for you pursuing them further or kind of letting them kind of go by the wayside if they're not going to be as beneficial. Um, yeah, it's sure. that idea of being value-led, isn't it? Like, if you mm. know what your values are, then you can sort of assess the opportunities that come to you, being like, okay, is this sort of in line with that? Great, I can, you know, go into that rather than thinking, in order for me to feel this, this and this, I have to do this. It's mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. I think most of the stuff that I've done that I've really enjoyed has been through serendipity. You know, it's yeah, I have so serendipity and um, a lot of you know, a lot of this it, it creates the sort of moments of chance and um, you know, when it's not defined what's going to happen next or yeah. where you can't pre plan. And in a way, that's always been the beauty. Of yeah, the and maybe. maybe it was going back to what you were saying about the pandemic and time it's it's almost like it's a bit of a training ground to learn that because i think in art school you you still are very structured by years you know like one two three four and so that time frame is there and then within that you have two semesters and two, so you know like you're very you're you're very defined to those and i think then leaving all of a sudden you've got to sort of figure out your practice in time yeah. and I think a lot of it is patience you know these things might happen but it, you know it doesn't matter necessarily if it doesn't happen straight away but there is always that panic isn't there that like I've got to be doing something and mm -hmm. so I think the because Covid we like nobody knew what they were going to be doing you know so I think it's learning to be okay with that and but still find contentment and fulfilment in it and, yeah. and fluidity is very interesting to me the fact that actually being responsive you have to what is more important is to learn to respond to changing conditions it's a bit like Elaine's saying about diving or something or you know just being thrown off course and 
well, I've, I've, circumstances mean that I have to do this. And, uh, and I think that there is really something in what you're all saying about, um, you know, in a way our education systems and art schools often are about kind of um, trying to, to, you know, professional practice and, you know, um, trying to kind of uh, fit yourself into a situation, but actually, in a way, maybe that's premature. You know, maybe maybe what's really important is how you navigate that. Now, you know, that might be my perspective, it might not be yours, but I, I'd be really interested to know whether, in a way, it's given you the freedom, that somehow, has the situation given you the freedom to think really differently about your future? about the way that you may be practicing the future, what's next? I mean, what is next for all of you? Maybe we should finish with that. What, what do you think is next for you all of you? I don't know. Um, I think that it's one thing that we maybe have like a little bit um, differently from what you're saying with your experience of like when you leave, because like we kind of have each other to hold on to in a way, do you know what I mean? Which is really nice, because I think I would have been a lot more like worried and anxious leaving art school and like what am I going to do? I mean, I still feel like that, <laughs> but like <laughs> it's, it's a bit easier, you know. Um, Keeps momentum knowing that you've got like yeah, yeah, yeah. But also on the other hand, it's like knowing to take breaks and being like, mm -hmm. you know, like talking about falling behind and being like, oh, if it, like we stopped and that's it, yeah, I'll never make it to anything again. Yeah, yeah. I'm just like, like I don't know. I feel like winter is so hard and boring and horrible, <laughs> and it's like. Is there any need to like put any pressure on yourself to do anything at all during those months? Like not really. <laughs> so that was nice as well to kind of come out of that and be like, oh, I didn't really do anything, but like that was good. <laughs> um, yeah. You see, that reminds me of the narratives of most really, really interesting artists. Because if you hear of them, I mean, we were talking about you'd just been down to see the Michael Clark exhibition, and that is absolutely. How, how his practice, he describes his practice, you know, not having money, would he get there? How would he do this, you know? But he, he's, he's got a calling somehow to do what he does. And, and, you know, and I think that there really is something interesting in the fact that none of the work that is in, say, the V&A at this moment in time that describes his practice would have happened if he hadn't have felt like, um, you know, I might as well just give up at times, you know, or mm -hmm. I might as well just, I don't know what's next, or, you know, the point was that he was prepared to think that way mm -hmm. and not feel the pressure of thinking there has to be something, mm -hmm. you know, that is right there in front of me. Yeah. It's about being open to what could be possible. Yeah. You know, so, and that strikes me as rather similar to your sort of speculative thinking as well. Yeah, like what, very, very, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, kind of going back on to like relationships, like what Joe and Claudia have as well. It's good to have that person. Good to have that like, not anchor, but like um, they keep you grounded, they keep you focused, and like, you know, when the going gets tough, you've got someone to kind of, yeah, without just sounding so like you know, live laugh love. You've got someone to really like <laughs> keep you up there, keep you going, you know, and like. Um, you know, again, like with the with the, the duo, you know, you yeah. they have each other. You know, I have my relationships. You know, I have I have. Yeah, it's good. I mean, I'm getting a bit off track here. I'm sorry about. No, 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 <laughs> but it's just about it. being able to bounce ideas off. Yeah, someone, yeah, so. yeah. Mm, yeah. And so I think this is a, a really good point for us to actually probably bring this to a close and try and um, uh, say what I'm really wanting to say about this is that um, it's really important not to just give kind of everything's wonderful, happy, you know, notion of, of the arts. But actually to say that that struggle or those journeys or the way that you kind of navigate those things brings great joy in what you're actually doing, you know, but it and it actually creates some like amazing, you know, that struggle in some ways creates you know amazing possibilities for the future for other people to respond to it. For, um, you know, to pass on in Kirsty's terms, you know, passing on ideas to the, the and, and possibilities as well as warnings from the past is something that 
is there in all of your practice. So I really thank you for what you are doing, you know, and, and that, you know, you feel that kind of commitment and all your commitment throughout the project has been really amazing. Um, so I think what we should do is we should um, uh, encourage everyone now, if possible, because I'm sure that you maybe just want to ask questions in the space and see the work, of course, that we've been introducing. And um, really thank you, um, Karen and the Aberdeen Art uh, uh, team for creating this kind of um, moment where we can have some conversation, reflect, think about what could be possible. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>